Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Schiller Institute community for this uh, very stimulating uh, conference and uh, Dean Andromedas for making it possible my, my coming here. Uh, and I'll go straight to the point. Um, it looks like um, the, it's a very complex situation to describe regarding Greece. Um, there is um, a confluence of events that uh, one can uh, try to address to, to address to regarding um, a lot of the things that were discussed and presented yesterday and today uh, regarding uh, the development issue, the problem of infrastructure, the importance of dealing with a new financial system that is uh, definitely not speculative nature of casino capitalism that uh, right now Greece uh, is feeling its impact on. And um, I will uh, try to uh, be as, as, as brief as possible. Um, one thing is that uh, it's established in the world of social science that development has to be social. That is, social capital is important in order to have economic also capital. Therefore, it's in the past 25 years, the World Bank and world institutions recognize that without developing social capital, which includes cultural capital, education, and political capital, it's impossible to have economical development. So we have to keep this in mind, and you can see what happens in Greece, what kind of economic development we're enjoying at present. Um, second, when we're talking about a system of states as the European Union claims to be, we have to understand that the strength of the chain is equal to the strength of its weakest link. Greece is part of the chain, and exactly the strength of the European Union is exemplified about exactly what is happening in, right now in Greece. Therefore, this precariousness of the situation shows not only the fragility, but perhaps shows that the end of a policy so far that has failed. And third, regarding Greece, we have to take account that we have a peculiar situation which regards a so-called hidden society. Most of Mediterranean states, when they enter the EU, a lot of them, particularly Portugal, Spain, and Greece, experienced military rule. They were exceptional states. And, of course, the southern part of Italy is also, in a way, exceptional as having a lot of informal state structures that are parallel to the state. Therefore, what we witnessed was a very weak analysis and representation of civil society institutions. It's not Sweden. It's something different. Therefore, the building of the, in the entry of the European Union was linked with integrative mechanisms of developing social studies and social analysis who begin to put away the mainstream legal, legal studies, which was characterized as part of state expression. Therefore, civil society institutions and analysis started slowly growing, and Catalonia is exemplified by that, and also the southern part of, uh, of Italy as well. Um, this did not happen in Greece. The opposition to the military regime wanted to have social science as a way of documenting and organizing social society institutions like a welfare system, social support, and social organization. This never happened in Greece in reality. Okay? A lot of religious institutions developed like social theology, but social, social science like sociology, social geography, uh, psychology, uh, demography, for instance, and social statistics are very weak subject, and basically they are not entertained in the main universities of the country, like in Thessaloniki and in Athens. So Athens is the only university in Europe that has no sociology department, has no geography department, its psychology department is part of education, and it has a lot of other things that are necessary for dealing with a social administration. Okay, the social aspect of the state rather than the police or other forms. 
at the same time, criminology is something that does basically does not exist, nor sociology of law. These are essential elements of defining social governance. Now, in reality, this absence was somehow offset and never discussed, and we had a lot of other professions dealing with social Europe. However, the Greek local government is the only probably in Europe that has no social fund administration. So when a mayor wants to give money or give to poor people a meal, there's no code for the, in the Greek administration. He has to rely on either on the church or he either has to take money from the construction of the roads. So a social need is, is subsumed to a technical, a physical thing. This inverted relation, of course, created an anomaly because the whole social is, if it's under a physical apparatus, you basically don't have any real evidence of a welfare system in existence. Therefore, poverty in Greece is a concept that is literary. Everybody, of course, describes a poor person, but there's no any institutional foundation of poverty. Other institutions apparently are operating in the European Union like basic income. It's a fiction in Greece. So uh, when you have 30% poverty and youth poverty 35, it's very difficult to understand that you have to have, for instance, cheaper price of milk and you have to distribute milk in schools because it's essential. And therefore, the poverty as, best, as articulated through supporting education uh, through the school system and support providing supplies for food is essential for actually understanding what poverty is and it's part of a welfare system. But this in Greece hasn't been able to be articulated at all. So we have the Eurostat statistics of one third of the population is under poverty, but basically who is ever dealing with poverty right now is the church through private welfare through private also voluntary uh, supply of food through the supermarkets, and it's a privately managed through, for instance, a television station called Sky, owned by a ship owner, and he's behaving like perhaps a 19th century <laughs> philanthropy institution. But this is exactly the way social Europe works in Greece. Um, so what we have now, why this happens? The debt in Greece was 120% of its GDP uh, when the crisis started. Uh, right, right now, the debt is 190%. At the same time, 25% of the wealth of the country has been wiped out. And what we have is a forceful extraction of surplus that is actually leaving the country. And basically, all the bailout is exactly is using Greece as an empty vessel that is going to pay the debt, is, distrib is turning, is making a lot of profits to outside sources. Uh, I have to stay a bit on what I call surplus, because during the feudal times, you had, of course, the forceful extraction of the rent from, by the landowners from the peasants. Here, you have a unique difference. What a surplus, because there's no separation in Greece about what is the cost of social reproduction. For instance, health, basic aid to elderly people, like through pensions, or all those who are uninsured. 30% of the Greek population is not insured. Okay, So medical insurance, health insurance, and also insurance for uh, child poverty, children have to be inoculated. Last year, 5,000 kids in Athens, apparently they, they didn't have enough money, which is ridiculous, to inocul inoculate them. Uh, so uh, what we have is a total privatization of what you call basic biological and social needs. And all these are being cut off in the name of austerity. In the spring, under the PSI so-called private haircut, they took money from public institutions like my university, which is not private. They took 80% of our research budget in order to go to, to ease the debt of, <laughs> of the banks. 
they took from welfare institutions the money they had deposited. And uh, a lot of uh, private uh, social security organizations who are dealing with handicapped children, like the Hadzi Kyriakion in Piraeus and a lot of others in other parts of Greece, they were forced to pay taxes on the property they had because the state is not providing any funding. But the fact that they have donated property and they are supplying their services through the rent system, um, the, the government is actually charging them. I remember because I know one of the persons who is working there is a colleague. They, they had to pay 600,000 euros as if being a private corporate agency. The fact that these are welfare institutions for poor children who are educated doesn't, make any, doesn't play any difference. The same happened with handicapped children in other parts. The deposits, the money they had in order to supply food and operate and teaching, they were eliminated. There's an institute in Athens who for 70 years was operating, and it had to close down a month ago because they could not fulfill the needs of the people, because they had to pay taxes. So there's no separation between what is a welfare agency, even if it's a private, the purpose of institutions who are destined for um, supplying the needs of those who are in need, they've been treated as if being somebody for profit. So it's a very hypocritical for the European Union to have produced a big kind of communication which was produced in the uh, April for 18th, sorry, uh, 18th of April, communication 183 final, who is actually declaring what they're doing for Greece. And in one of the elements of the, of the statement saying the following, Greece could use the currently untapped potential of the social economy, the voluntary sector, through the support of the European Social Fund, which provides an important support for new job creation and can address the growing need for social services. This is ridiculous. There's absolutely no effect in the social economy, and the, France has a, used to, has a deputy minister for the social economy. The European Parliament is working on the social economy. In Greece, the social economy is an anecdote. Social enterprises cannot operate. So imagine, in this type of crisis, if you are not able to allow the voluntary sector to be steering resources, because you are taxing the voluntary sector if it is like private for corporation. You have uh, cooperative hotels who are being taxed as if being private for profit hotels in an area which is extremely poor and underdeveloped. So basically, the social economy is becoming private economy and its assets are privatized and being taxed. So basically, what you have here is a catastrophe. And uh, this catastrophe is, uh, is of a global nature because I think if uh, anyone in the world understand what's going on, it, because it has nothing to do because we're being in Europe. Anywhere in the world, if something like that had happened, people should have been protesting. Maybe the period of Carlos Menem in Argentina can be compared with what is happening right now in Greece in the name of, uh, of European uh, uh, self-sufficiency. So what we have here is a kind of blocking of any social reaction to the time of the crisis. That's why in Greece, we have a very different expression of this crisis than we've had in Cyprus years ago when there was the Turkish army invading. There was a welfare institution developed in, in Cyprus. Uh, the reaction in many European countries in terms of this onslaught is different. In Greece, we don't have the means of defense. Why? Because we also have a very corrupt political system. We have a lot of scandals. Nobody pays taxes. The tax evasion is actually managed by the administration. We don't have representation in our taxes. To give you an example, when last week the figures for poverty were released, the, the only institution that reacted to those figures was a private institution based in Austria called SOS Children's Villages and a private welfare foundation uh, created by Niarchos, which is a big uh, foundation, uh, welfare foundation in Greece, but also a big uh, shipping uh, family. 
the reaction was, what they plan to do for poverty. But I, care, I know, and a lot of Greeks have been given special funding for social support. Our taxation has doubled because they're taxing us to aid all this social crisis. But our money is not going where it's supposed to go. So we are completely taken by surprise because the system is not credible. They have no credibility. And the thing is, they're stealing money. We don't know where it, we know where it goes, certainly leaving the country, but it's a bottomless pit. We are, because we are not uh, digital, we have physical limits. There's no, this, there's limits to how long this we can continue. And I can foresee that Greece uh, might explode like uh, Argentina in 2001 for sure if this is continuing. Because a corrupt political system, taxation were being bled white by those who can pay. And at the same time, you have 1,000 unemployed a day. Well, technically, unemployment is something like 25%, but only it doesn't cover the people who work and don't, they don't get paid because you have half a million people who are working and don't get paid in enterprises that the state owes money. 10 billion euros are owed by the state to Greek businesses, but they're waiting the bailout to pay them, but the bailout is not going to give them what they want. It's going to give half percent of what exactly the state needs to bump it into the real economy. So basically, all this bailout is not going to Greece. At the same time, the high unemployment and the high inflation is leading the people to exasperation. 150,000 people left. 5,000 Greek doctors are in Germany. 25,000 to 30,000 are trying to find a job in Berlin. Everywhere you find Greeks trying to find a job because they also had to abandon their businesses because 30% this year of businesses is closing down. So technically, the investment climate can be compared only with Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, this is uh, the business community doesn't think that Greece is a credible business place because basically there's no ground to do any investment. Even the money that we are supposed to be borrowing is not directed to creating some infrastructure, investing in what? In education? No. My university is closed. Why? Because they fired 40 people and they have to disappear. Local community now in Greece is on strike because they're cutting back without having any plans how to set up facilities for collective consumption, how to set up facilities by which the state or the local government could operate not only social services, but also be able to have facilities for general interest. And basically, in Greece, what we have here, we never had really a system of general interest established in local government. We had only a system of special interests, and that is the problem. And this only this special interest made an alliance with the banking ruling elite, and right now they have... They're accelerating a fire that is exactly is not being put out, but is actually is expanding. So basically, Greece is in a paralysis at present. And irrespective of what will happen on Monday, whether the funding will be released, Greece is in an emergency situation. And I believe everything that the, the people have been saying here about, uh, of course, reforming the banks, the, the glass needle has to start with Greece. And... I think it has to be made very vocal because we suffer, we, have, we are the epitome of exactly what you've been describing, but we have it in a much more pure form. And this pure form is, is killing the system in, in a sense. The fact that we don't have documentation because reporting is lax is also part of the problem. So um, there is a, a situation by which I had a lot of tables about to show you about uh, unemployment figures and what is going on. The labor market does not work. We don't have a labor market. We had a nepotist system, okay? Uh, qualifications in Greece, although you have a lot of highly skilled people, there's never, they can never find the job they demand because nepotism 
and the lack of meritocracy has been part of the problem. Okay. The former Prime Minister Papandreou promised to do something of which accountability would establish, but this never happened. So you have in Greece a classical traditional system where skills are defined by personal interests. Okay. At the same time, that's why the system is in its application. It's more pure in Greece because there was no resistance. Skilled labor left. And if we didn't have the opening of free movement in Europe, Greece would have been either like Egypt or Tunisia. There's no reason about it because the pressures in the country has been so high, but skilled labor and those who could do the change could move somewhere else. Therefore, steam was let, and therefore, we didn't have the explosion and the change of regime that other countries in the, in the, in the Mediterranean and had experienced. So uh, there is a limit, however, for how long this can happen because there is a depletion of human capital. And uh, I have the feeling that because Greece is a strategic country, it has the promise, it is the gate of Europe from Asia. The economy now is not transatlantic, it is Euro-Asian economy. Therefore, there has to, is, a deal has been made, I think, between uh, probably the Chinese and the Germans leading the European Union how to distribute resources and develop some transport networks. At the same time, uh, Greece, uh, uh, the Greeks, uh, maybe they are not useful. I mean, they, 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 they don't need that. They need, they need um, the country, and they actually did a fantastic deal. They privatized the agricultural bank with all the debts that it owns for a fraction. They sold to a private bank, the agricultural bank, for 95 million euros. The idea was, before the crisis, to set up a public bank, including the agricultural bank and the post office bank. But in reality, the banking lobby won. So they sold to a private bank that six months ago could not exist. They sold to uh, the Bank of Piraeus, the, the agricultural bank, for a fraction of its worth, and also most of private land because of the debts it went to a private uh, thing. Because Greece, uh, as you probably know, uh, it has a lot of minerals. It's a strategic country. It has a lot of uh, uh, gold, for instance. It could be the first producer of gold in Europe, thanks to Canadian investments. It has uh, also the strategic link of being in the South Europe and linking Asia with Europe and Vienna and the corridor to, to Kiev and Moscow. And um, it has also another thing, which I will finish after saying this famous European paradigm. Greece, uh, in the middle of Greece, we have um, a region called Thessaly. It is actually the first place that bread was baked ever in Europe, thousands of years ago, close to Meteora, which is the monastic, uh, the monastery is on top of the rocks. Um, Thessaly used to be the, the green belt of Greece producing wheat, animal feed, corn. Uh, during the year, period of the European Union, it was transformed into a cotton belt. Greece produces probably more cotton than Egypt. And I guess the policy was we don't need to import cotton from Egypt or Syria because there are other countries. So Greece became the first producer of cotton in Europe. But this megastructure created an ecological catastrophe the level of the water, they have to go deep to 600 meters now to get water, and Greece, this part of Greece became like Netherlands because it's 20 centimeters below sea level because of the, of the problem of... Uh, and at the same time, they wanted to have divert resources from a river, Achelos, who is also supplying water to Athens. They spent a lot of money to divert the river in order to supply water to... Uh, Thessaly for the cotton production because cotton absorbs four and five times. At the same time, Greece is importing wheat, is importing f for uh, animal feed, and at the same time, it is um, all the factories that we had for, the, for um, processing cotton and textiles are closed. So the moment we started producing raw material, and this raw material, we're not using it. Our, the Greek clothes are imported from other countries. We have no processing. 90% of our clothes 
are now imported. So we are a country like India in the 19th century compared to England. We export to global uh, agents uh, cotton, which is processed, and then is re-imported in Greece. Uh, at the same time, we have the ecological problem. We import a lot of food, like wheat. Uh, we import um, two and a half billion euros in meat from France, for instance, because we destroy also our animal husbandry because of this. And at the same time, uh, our tourist industry imports 80% of the food who is supplied through other countries uh, because uh, our, we became a country who supplies with raw materials, Germany, Italy, other countries, they're processing our food and we're importing. So we basically were transformed into a third world country because we export raw materials and we import. And this has been the situation for our agricultural industry. 100 billion euros was given to Greek cooperatives, but most of them are very corrupt. They used to employ political cadres and uh, they used to use uh, foreign labor to uh, take the fruits, and the European Union was paying us to destroy the crop because they want to keep farmers happy or because the same food was imported in processed, uh, processed form from other countries. So it's been a kind of crazy situation of all the subsidies went to a negative way. We have a fertile territory, but we produce food that is not used for us, and we became a third world country in terms. And now, as a result of this collapse, because the subsidies are terminating next year, the whole thing is Greece is becoming, has a food crisis. It has a food crisis because uh, there hasn't been any kind of processing of the raw materials. Uh, the local industry is supplied from imports. And there's no real focus exactly what is going on. And those industries who are successful, the, go the government is selling them for nothing. For instance, one of the biggest dairy farming companies, Dodoni, in North Greece, was uh, classified by the Minister of Economics as being not viable. The moment is a profit-making industry because it exports feta all over the world, and it's one of the real flag uh, bearers of Greek, um, you know, Greek uh, food. Uh, it was sold to a company which is based in British Virgin Islands, which has nothing to do with it. And the, the, though the cooperative uh, guys uh, managed to have the money and said, look, we want to buy our share because the agricultural bank was privatized. So all the successful cooperatives have to be sold. But the people wanted to buy it. So in many instances where workers want to buy a cooperative in order to manage it themselves or use uh, any means available in a European Union institution, they were blocked. And the, the, there now you have 7,000 farmers in North Greece, which is the poorest of the European Union, are actually occupying the factory, and they wanted to see who is the person who bought the factory and find out why he bought it the moment they had the money to buy it. So this is, this is a kind of, uh, you can call it economic dictatorship, whatever you can call it. But even if you have uh, the media, which is apparently so flexible, it's amazing why there's such a black spot when it comes to Greece. Because in Greece happens exactly what you've been describing <laughs> these two days, and it's in vivo. It's, it's going on in its more pure form. And I think this is why the Siller Institute should become more focused in uh, what is happening in Greece as not something that is applied to Greece. It is exactly what you have been warning the people of, that this is exactly what is happening and it can spread around and I think uh, this would be my, you know, I'd like to, to end up my presentation by making a plea that uh, we should cooperate more clearly about uh, the situation. And it's not the kind of philanthropy thing about Greece. This is exactly, you know, I believe uh, all the presentations were made in true honesty and it was not theater. It was, uh, you know, you believe what you're saying. And uh, even if some people were not aware that these things happen, and it's not in the past. It actually happens at the present. It's not the future. It happens now, and this emergency situation, it's a complete failure of Europe, is happening right now in the country that gave the name to Europe. Thank you.